Hello, welcome, and thank you for joining our webinar on the optimization of Xeroville ion technology for the in situ remediation of chlorinated contaminants. My name is Gareth Leonard. I'm the Managing Director of Regenesis in Europe, and today I have the pleasure of introducing John Freem, a colleague of mine who works at our headquarters in San Clemente and our colloid man manufacturing and laboratory facility in Oceanside, both in California. Before we begin, though, a little housekeeping. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can submit them at any point using the questions interface, which is located in your control panel. At the end, we will have a short question and answer session where we'll answer your questions. If, however, we don't manage to answer your questions uh, during this session, we might run out of time. We'll email you afterwards uh, and ensure that any questions you ask are answered. For the best possible audio and visual connection, we recommend that you close all other programs on your computer, if your audio deteriorates during the webinar, close and restart GoToWebinar, and that should fix it. If not, um, send us a message on the questions and we'll see if it's something that we can sort from our end. Okay, I'm very pleased to introduce my esteemed colleague, Dr. John Freem, who holds a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a PhD in Material Science from the University of California, San Diego. John has over 30 years of experience in material science, working on research projects for the American Environmental Protection Agency, Department of Energy, Missile Defense Agency, National Institute of Health, and US Air Force. It was around 15 years ago that John developed an interest in environmental remediation when an environmental consulting firm um, asked if they would use his experience in material synthesis and processing to produce a colloidal iron for environmental remediation. Uh, this produced very encouraging results, and he decided to focus his research efforts to produce colloidal iron and other products specifically for the use of environmental remediation. John has patented several innovative engineering nanomaterials and, found and founded and operated his own remediation company specializing in zero villain iron. John, John joined Regenesis in 2018 to become our Zero Villain Iron Product Manager and Director of Material Science, in which role he is involved in both the design and implementation of materials and processes to manufacture colloidal materials, including colloidal iron, our colloidal activated carbons, and some very exciting new products we will be seeing in the future. The technology that John will be talking about today is S micro zero villain iron, which is a very powerful, very flexible, very useful in situ chemical reductant. And it is right at the cutting edge of material science with new papers on sulfidation coming out all the time. Since we launched our colloidal sulfidated zero villain iron product in 2018 in the US, uh, we've completed around about 100 projects in the US. We launched a little bit later in 2019 in Europe and have completed 12 sites so far with the use of this product both expanding and accel accelerating. During this time, John and our R&D team have continued to do some very interesting research in order to optimize treatment and continue to push this exciting technology forward. In today's talk, John will be introducing the concepts behind this remediation technology works, what benefits it brings, and the support and the, and supporting this with some of our latest research. I'll hand over to John now. Thank you, Gareth, for the very gracious introduction. I'm happy to be here and hopefully we can teach you some things about how our zero variant iron products work and what differentiates them from other products in the marketplace. So when you're doing an in-situ remediation job, I think there's kind of four cornerstones that you have to identify and address ahead of time. One is obviously reactivity. You know, what you use for your iron in this case has to react with and remove your contaminants in, in the groundwater. And that's, that's certainly an important thing, but for it to work, you also have to um, consider a few other things. One's distribution. You have to be able to get these remediation amendments into the ground and in contact with your, your contaminants. It could be the most reactive material in the world, but if you don't bring it into contact, it's not gonna work. On top of that, you want something that's persistent or lasts for a long time. Um, you can use a very, very powerful reactant, but if it fizzles away after a day or two, it's really not gonna do you a whole lot of good because you're gonna have a rebound. And on top of that, you want something that's easy to use and safe to use. So S0, um, S-micro-ZBI, 
and the other amendments that are produced by Regenesis are actually all engineered to satisfy each of these requirements. So I'll get you back into a little bit of fundamental um, information about ZBI, how it works. Uh, so it's a reductant. Another way to say that is it's a material that, that oxidizes and supplies electrons. These electrons are transferred to your contaminant. In this case, it's um, PCE, C2Cl4, and as that, as that is reduced, it uh, loses chlorines and gains hydrogens. And there's a little bit of a chemical equation there showing you the, the uh, reaction in, in place. One thing that's really great about zero valent iron is that it, it doesn't behave as you might expect it would um, compared to a biological process, for example. If you look across this top pathway, you can see the sequential reduction of PCE to ethene. It's a five-step process where you're losing one chlorine and adding a hydrogen. And this is what generally what you'll see in biological reduction. But for some reason, iron actually has a, has a better pathway. If you look at the lower pathway with, with the double hatched arrows, you have a, it's still a two electron reduction process, but instead of involving the daughter products such as cis and vinyl, you have these short lived transit intermediaries such as dichloroacetylene and chloroacetylene, and you can bypass the, the formation of all these uh, daughter products. Now the top product, the top pathway is an abiotic um, pathway as well, and you will see a little bit of cis in the degradation, but for the most part, you're gonna avoid these entirely and you can go straight to your desired end product. So what is S micro ZBI? Um, it's kind of a uh, acronym or an abbreviation for sulfidated microscale ZBI. And if you look here on the right, it's an artist depiction. What you, what you have is a core shell microstructure. It's engineered where you actually have a core of zero valent iron that constitutes the, the vast majority of the volume of the particle. What we do is we, we deposit, electro electrochemically deposit a reduced iron sulfide layer on top of the, the iron core. So you have this, this special structure that, that we'll show you later on, gives you a lot of advantages compared to bare iron. Now it's interesting, if you dig back in the literature, this structure was first reported in about 1995. But I don't think the, the, the remediation world actually realized the advantages of it. It took a couple decades and it actually was first commercialized in about 2017. So that's kind of the, the cartoon character, that picture there. We're going to try to give you a little more of a scientific view. And what we did is we went to Caltech University in Southern California and they have this fancy machine there with all the wires and everything hanging out of it. It's called SIMS or secondary ion mass spectrometry. And what this does is actually allows you to see the uh, composition of the particles on the surface and also in the interior. So we like to think of it as a microscope that reads mass. There at the bottom right there, there's a uh, basically a standard SEM picture of the S micro ZBI. And how this operates is that you impact the surface of these, these particles with a cesium ion beam and the detector will actually um, read or, or, or distinguish what element it's seeing on, on the surface. So this is a depiction here of the sulfidated iron. This is not at the beginning of the process. This is about halfway through where you see some red, which is sulfur, and you see some green, which is iron. And I'll show you in a minute here, a little slideshow on how we progress with time. So one thing that's also important to know is that this is a destructive process. When the cesium ion beam hits the surface, it actually etches away and removes the uh, atoms um, one, one at a time. So you, you're gonna be able to actually do a cross section and see not only what's on the, what's on the surface at the beginning, but what's on the interior. So here's a slideshow. At the beginning, it's all red. You see that? That indicates that you have a, a fully sulfidated surface. With time, as we, as we go into here, then maybe to slide 20, all you see is green with a little bit of a, a red halo around the outside of the particles. 
which depicts the, uh, the, the sulfonated layer kind of at the periphery. So this really confirms uh, what, we, what we know about the particles that we actually have a, a very, very good core shell microstructure. So that's what the stuff looks like and what it is. Let's talk about the reactivity. In San Clemente, California, we have a, a very advanced treatability um, study um, group who, who's done a lot of experiments to test the reactivity of this material. Some, some are done in bottles, some are done in columns. This test here was a bottle test and where we put uh, 240 milliliters of anoxic water into these bottles, spike it with a moderately high concentration of TCE, about uh, 20 milligrams per liter or 20 ppm. And we use a fairly low dose of ZVI, about four grams per liter, which is fairly typical of what you'll see in, in the field on a pore volume basis. So we take the concentration of TCE and the daughter products over time. And you can see we have a, a pretty rapid degradation here. Um, and if this is very, very much indicative of what's called first order rate kinetics or pseudo first order rate kinetics. What you can do is plot the log of the concentration versus time and you can get a rate constant. And you can see there in, in the graph, it's about 0.227 uh, per day. Another way to, um, look at that as the half-life is about three days and the, the data fits really well on the curve. If you compare that to unsulfidated iron, same uh, initial starting concentration, same dose, you get much, much, much slower kinetics. It's actually very difficult to measure at, at this dose of four grams per liter. To do this properly, you probably would have to put in, you know, 10 times as much iron. But if you, you can run the rate constants on this and uh, the, the kinetics for TCE are about 50 times greater than bare iron. And this is really dramatic. And we're not the only ones at Regenesis that have seen this. This has also been published in uh, academic research journals as well, where they see a, a similar enhancement in, in reactivity. So let's talk about daughter products. Um, you can see there at the bottom of that plot, there the, the yellow triangles show the amount of cis that's produced in this reactivity study. And the red diamonds show the amount of vinyl chloride that's produced in this study. And if you dig into these numbers, it looks like we get about a 10% DCE yield. So most of this reactivity is going through that lower beta elimination pathway, but well, I'm not gonna lie to you, there is a little bit of cis that's, that's produced and very, very, very little vinyl. It's important to realize though that any cyst that is produced does get subsequently degraded through the abiotic process. Uh, if you look at the, the plot here on the right, you can see it takes longer. Um, the, the K is 0 0.0055 per day. And I can go through the, uh, the math. I believe the half-life is on the order of about 100 days, which interestingly enough is about the uh, reactivity of, of bare iron with TCE. So you will get rid of your cysts. It's just going to be a little bit slower, but generally in situ remediation is, you, you know, you kind of wait it out. It, it seems like a long time, but eventually it's going to go away. So that's the reactivity. You know, the results are really striking. And every time I show these, these plots to people, they, they get really excited. So what I've tried to do is, is dig into what's happening mechanistically in uh, the process why the sulfidated material behaves differently than, than a traditional bare iron product. So uh, what happens in, in these reactions, it's really a multi-step process. And the first thing is contact. You actually have to bring your dissolved phase contaminant, in, in this case, there's a TCE molecule on the upper left, onto the particle surface, because that's actually where the reactions occur. That's step one. The next step is the oxidized, your ZVI core and the electrons that, that are produced by it are transported to the surface of the particle where the, uh, where the reaction occurs. And that's depicting it going away to ethene. So it's a contact sport. 
what's important here is that you have to consider the uh, adsorption behavior and the transport of the electrons from the ZBI to the contaminant. So let's talk about bare ZBI particles or, or commodity ZBI or your powders that, that you would buy um, uh, traditionally for this, this process. One thing that you need to realize is that iron is really not stable in air or in water. The thermodynamic, thermodynamically favored configuration is to have some sort of iron oxide or iron hydroxide and oxidized species on the surface of the ZBI. So actually these are a core shell um, products as well. But instead of having a sulfide on the surface, you have an oxide layer on the surface. And this, this causes problems. The, the oxide's not reacti reactive, so you get passivation. And it's also not as good of absorbent. You don't get as good a contact with the contaminant. So let's dig into this a little bit deeper. We still have our, our oxidized ZBI particle on the left. One thing that, that, that needs to be uh, understood by the public is that a lot of the uh, reactions that happen are not with the contaminant. They're actually, you're electrochemically reducing water to form uh, molecular hydrogen and hydroxide. And it's kind of wasted iron because you really, you're trying to reduce your contaminants, not your water. Might be a little bit of a secondary benefit where the hydrogen can be used by microbes in the process, but it's generally inefficient. Also, when every time this happens, you, you're removing ZBI, you're forming more hydroxide, which thickens the shell, and you end up with a, a decrease in uh, reactivity. So it might happen quickly at first, then a little bit slower, and eventually you're going to have what I consider to be a fully passivated particle where you, you don't get any reactivity or, or very, very little reactivity with your contaminants. So here's this, this, the uh, iron sulfide core shell um, particle instead. As you noticed from the, the SIMS um, video, we didn't have any oxide or very, very little oxide on the surface. We had sulfide instead. And it's not that dissimilar to what happens in, a, in a, an oxidized particle. The electrons are still coming from the core and they're being conducted through the iron sulfide shell but you're not getting passivation because you're not forming nearly as much oxide or, or hydroxides on the surface. And as you see, we get enhanced reactivity with the chlorinated ethanes. So one thing that, that's been learned over the past few years is that the iron sulfide surface behaves quite differently than the oxide surface. It's more hydrophobic. Um, which is good because the, the, the contaminants in groundwater are also hydrophobic. So they actually tend to stick or absorb better to the surface. At the same time, water is repelled from the surface. Uh, water would be more attracted to a, a hydrophilic surface. So you get a preferential absorption of your contaminants on the surface. That's our contact. They're more likely to take in um, place in the reactions with the ZBI, so you get better reactivity. So this is kind of the first thing. Your surface preferentially adsorbs your contaminants instead of water. So that leads to better electron efficiency. You know, you don't want your electrons going to water. You want them to go into the contaminant. And you don't get much. The water reaction is very, very low to near zero which means that you don't get hydroxides and passivation and your sulfide layer stays in place. And most of your electrons actually go to reducing the contaminant. There have been studies that have, that have done this and they show that you get about a 99% efficiency of uh, dehalogenization and only about 1% going to water. The other thing that, that, that sulfide provides you in, in uh, relation to oxide, it's a really good electrical conductor. Oxide is, is an insulator. The electrons that, that, that start in the core, when they, trans, when they travel through the surface, 
they uh, don't go very quickly because they, this is not very good conductivity through oxide. But iron two sulfide is not like that. It's almost metal-like. So once you get your contaminants adsorbed to the surface, the electrons pass through with very, very little resistance and you get really rapid kinetics. So that's kind of the, the, um, the end of the reactivity part of this presentation. And uh, we're really, really excited that we, we can actually have a engineered material that's tailored specifically for chlorinated contaminants and, and works extremely well. Uh, so we'll segue here into the distribution part of the talk. And what we have here on the left is S micro ZVI particles in a one liter um, bottle of water. And on the right, there's 40 micron coarser commodity ZVI particles that it's in the same bottle. And you can see that the, 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 on the right, the, uh, the larger particles end up settling very, very quickly to the bottom of the jar. And that's to be expected because, you know, iron is dense. The specific gravity is almost eight. So it's, it's going to want to be acted on by gravity and, and collect on the bottom of the jar. There is a little bit of uh, resistance to settling um, through Stokes' law uh, in, uh, of the, the viscous drag of the um, particles in water. But if you look at the math of that, the, the viscous drag is increased greatly when you have small particles. So they're more buoyant. I mean, I guess an analogy would be dropping a feather through air versus dropping a rock through air. What happens is that you, once you get these small particle sizes in suspension, they actually stay suspended for a longer time before you have to you know, shake it up or stir it up again. It's not infinitely um, stable, but it's certainly good enough to get the stuff in the ground in the field. We add uh, transfer polymers, there are dispersants that help maintain the suspension and that coupled with the small particle size gives you a, a better injectability and distribution in the ground. So this is, this is even better. This is actually a video comparing the behavior of commodity ZBI to S micro ZBI. So well, we should start to see this here. Okay, there's commodity ZBI powder, 50 microns approximately. Drop it into the beaker and you can see it more or less settles down to the bottom. You can stir it up a little bit. You might get a little bit of agitation, but gravity is acting on it and you're gonna end up with settled material at the bottom of the beaker. We take our colloidal suspension of S micro ZBI Apply it to the bottom. Gentle agitation here with the spoon. You can see it's actually starting to suspend. And a few minutes later, it's still fully in suspension. Um, so this is going to give you a lot better distribution into the ground. Here's another way to put it. Um, this is kind of shows you what what we think happens in the ground when you inject a colloidal product versus a commodity product. On top here is a similar uh, illustration of a colloidal ZBI being put into a fish tank and we did remove the fish before this process. So you're not gonna get the uh, animal cruelty people after me here, but um, you can see it blooms. It's, it's a good colloidal suspension. And on the right there is a sandbox where we're injecting um, the material at very, very low pressures. It's probably about five PSI. And you see you get a nice uniform distribution in front of your iron particles in your sand. What that's showing is that you're actually getting, the particles are small enough to fit within the interconnected pore volume of the sand and you get um, uniform distribution, what could also be considered as plug flow. Now, commodity iron is, is it's settles so quickly. The only way you can really, really get the stuff in, in the ground is to thicken it. So there are thickeners such as guar that you can use, or there's some products which thicken when you add water to them um, off, off the shelf as powders. And you end up getting this like pudding-like sludge that's very, very viscous. You know, viscosity, I'd say, is 100,000 center poise or more. And, is that, and that on the bottom left there is actually product in a grout pump. 
we're using a grout pump to inject the material. And the problem with that is, is that you're gonna have to use very high pressures to, to put this stuff in the ground. And on the lower right there kind of depicts what we think the distribution looks like. You get channeling or fractures in the ground where you have a lot of your, your, your subsurface that's not treated. So colloidal products will generally give you a much, much better and even distribution of product in the ground. So we're going on to our third cornerstone of reactivity. It's persistence or lifetime. This is a bottle test or a batch test that we did in San Clemente. And the, the yellow uh, vertical lines uh, represent where TC was added to the bottle. And the red line is the cis concentration over time and the, and the solid blue line is the TCE concentration over time. The, uh, the, the dash line is actually a control sample with no iron in it to, to show that you know, over time we get an increase in concentration. And this test is about a year out. And as you can see, every single time that we spiked this bottle, the TCE went away very rapidly with only a minor increases of, of cis, which also degraded. And there's been a lot of TCE added to this bottle, over 200 milligrams per liter. In a year, there's essentially no loss in reactivity. We've also done this work in column experiments. This involves prepacking a sand column with iron particles and flowing a one to two milligram per liter TCE uh, solution up through the column. And then you measure the concentration and the effluent that comes out the top of the column. These things run about one pore volume per week. So you see right now this test is at over 60 pore volumes or about 60 weeks. And we pretty boring results. Uh, you see almost nothing coming out the, the test. And after about 55 weeks, we got a little frustrated that we weren't seeing anything. So actually this test is, is, we're trying to stress the system with a higher TCE concentration and actually using aerobic water to try to get a better understanding of when the, the material actually expires. But extremely encouraging results that we, we get a year of reactivity under constant flux of, of contaminants with no loss of efficacy. Talk about ease of use. Now, these, this material, if you're not familiar with it, you might think that iron is a powder. You know, it looks, looks like, you know, sugar, or flour, et cetera. This material is actually a, a, a concentrated colloidal suspension. We get about 40 weight percent iron in a, a carrier um, suspension that's primarily glycerol. So the viscosity of the material is a couple thousand centipoise as a concentrate. But when you add it to the uh, mixing tank with water at a typical concentration, it's very, very water-like. The viscosity is essentially one centipoise you end up with kind of a, a, a gray water, which I'll show you a video here on the next slide. Um, the particles are buoyant, only require gentle agitation. You don't need sophisticated stirrer in there. And they're also, this material, the iron is compatible with other common remediation amendments, such as the organic amendments, plume stop colloidal carbon, or dehalocaloides or dechlorinating microbes. When you inject it, you generally use low pressures, typically below 20 PSI. That varies on site. It can be a little bit higher or a little bit less. But we, we try to keep the, the material below the uh, fracture stress of the soil to minimize channeling and daylighting. The equipment is simple. You don't have to use a high pressure pump like a Moino. You can use a, a pneumatic or electric diaphragm pumps. Flexible, you can use direct push technology with various tooling, including screens, or you can also inject the material into permanent screen wells. And that's something you cannot do with commodity iron. It'll just end up collecting at the bottom of the well and, and clogging the screen. Shallow or deep, greater barrier, it's very flexible. So here's an example of S micro ZBI and 3 dme being mixed on site before the injection. So as I said earlier, it's kind of a, a grayish water. The 3 dme is whitish, but the, the gray kind of takes over the color. So let's compare 
these products to other ZBI products that are in the marketplace. So this is kind of a messy graph, but it really does give you a lot of information once you look at it. Um, on the left hand, we're going to start with smaller products or soluble iron, such as you know ferrous iron, ferrous gluconate, ferrous sulfate, for example. Really not technically ZBI, but it's it's related. So we'll, we'll put it on the on the plot. Go a little bit farther over, you get nano ZBI, which is about 0.2 microns on average. And the center is our S micro product, somewhere one to four microns, uh, typical particle size. And as we go to the right, we get bigger particles and all the way up to scrap iron. So let's talk about the kinetics. That's the, the orange or the yellow um, line on, on the plot that, that starts at the top left and, and slips down to the, the, the lower right. Generally, smaller products are more reactive. There's more surface area. They react very fast. So nano ZBI is going to give you very, very fast reactivity. If you um, go to bigger particles, it's not going to be quite as fast, and the scrap iron is going to be very, very, very slow. But we have to also consider longevity or persistence. The nano iron is reactive, but it is almost too reactive. It goes away uh, maybe a month or two after injection. On the other side of the of this chart, you know, the scrap iron is going to be in the ground for a long time, but with slow reactivity. And if you go to the, the center here, it's kind of the best of both worlds. And that's how we've come upon this uh, near microscale size for, for colloidal iron. You get reactive particles, but you also get persistence. You kind of get the, the, the best of both worlds. It's a, it's a sweet spot per se. Now the, uh, the curvy line, um, that kind of depicts the transport or how easy the material is to apply into the ground. So a soluble iron, is basically like injecting water. It's gonna go any place where you can get water. But you notice there's a dip with nano ZVI. And that's because these particles are so small, they tend to agglomerate. They, um, have, in, they have surface forces that kind of clump them up. And instead of injecting discrete particles, you're actually injecting agglomerates or clusters of, of nanoparticles. And they behave like you know the, a larger commercial um, ZVI product. It's one of the reasons why nano ZBI has not really taken off in the marketplace uh, is that, it, that it's not as easy to inject. But once you get to about a micron or so, we can use our dispersants or transport polymers that maintain separation, that prevent agglomeration, and you get really good in, in, injectivity. As you go to the right, once you get you know 10 microns or so, you run the problems with settling and, and having fracturing and uneven distribution. I mean, there are ways to apply these, these bigger particles there. They could be soil mixing or trenching or, or high pressure and fracturing. But if you wanna do a, a controlled low pressure injection, you're really gonna to have to use the smaller particles. So, you know, ZBI is a great solution alone, but it also has synergies with other technologies. And one of them is plume stop. And if you're not familiar with that, it's a colloidal activated carbon that's produced by Regenesis that has a particle size of about a micron, which is two to three orders small of magnitude smaller than granulated activated carbon or GAC. And because the particle size is so small, you get rapid absorption kinetics, high absorption capacity, and it's also easy to inject and, and distribute into the ground. So even though it's a good uh, absorbent, one thing that you do need to remember is that activated carbon does not directly promote degradation. For it to work, you actually have to add a second technology that uh, degrades the, uh, the contaminants. So what we have here is the ability to co-apply plume stop or colloidal carbon with ZVI. Particles have about the same particle size, they're injected similarly, and they actually go into the ground together. So we'll start a video here. The center is a mobile porosity. Sand grains, for example, we're injecting the plume stop ZBI mixture. It actually coats the surface of the particles. So you have a coating of carbon and ZBI there. And as the contaminants pass through with the water flow, 
you absorb them onto the surface, which has activated carbon. You can also absorb them from back diffusion from the, the uh, denser material, such as the clay, and you get degradation by the iron, which is important because you end up opening up um, new sites and you're far less likely to saturate the surface of your, your carbon particles. You have a sustained process. So there's a couple ways to do this. Um, ZBI would give you abiotic degradation. Uh, it's totally uh, compatible with Plume Stop. You don't get much daughter products, you get rapid kinetics, but you can also use biological degradation using organic donors as well. It's an established technology, easy to apply, uh, you can use lactate and other water soluble amendments. But um, one thing that, that is important to know is that some amendments such as EVO can inhibit absorption onto the carbon. And you, you gotta take that into consideration. And with biological degradation, you also produce daughter products. So Bloom Stop will work in either way. If you have any questions, call your district manager and we can work your, your way through what method to choose. The other method that we, we combine ZBI is with bioremediation. We can call it ZBI assisted bioremediation. This is a test in San Clemente where we have columns like we did on the other ZBI test. The, the uh, biological control, we use sodium lactate as our donor, nutrients and dehalocacoides that are, that are flowed as a solution up through the column. And those are the control cells. And then we also have the, the ZBI assist, assisted column where we pre-dose the uh, column with ZBI before we do the, uh, the flowing of the amendments up through the column. And we get really, really good results. So here on the, on the left-hand plot is the biological column. And you can see in the, the green line at the beginning, you, you have breakthrough of not only TCE, but also the daughters. Uh, the TCE elution continued till about week seven. And as earlier, these have about one pore volume per week is, is, is the flow rate of the contaminant through these, these columns. And you get maximum daughter products at about week seven as well. And you had daughter products that continue to elute through the column all the way through week 10. By adding just a little bit of iron to the column, you, you, a lot of good things happen. For, first of all, we didn't see TCE eluted at any time during the process. So by the time that contaminant entered the column at the bottom and, and, and um, came out about a week later, you know, all, the, all the TCE was re removed. There were some daughter products that, that were eluted. These maximized at about week five, but after week seven, nothing was produced. So there's probably a couple of things going on here. You, you have some abiotic degradation. And also I think you have this, the more fertile or better conditions for anaerobic biodegradation as well. So in summary, ZBI has been used since the 1990s in remediation. It's come a long way. We've basically taken a, a colloidal ZBI product and made a good technology great. And as I said at the beginning, we've addressed the key cornerstones for a successful in situ project, such as reactivity, delivery, persistence and ease of use. And for your information, that is me up in the upper right-hand corner, actually on a wellhead, working a job site. My uh, son said I look like Bob the Builder there. I'm not sure if Bob the Builder is in Europe, but if, if not, you can Google it. And that lower rights, James Harvey is our production manager who actually supervises the production of our colloidal products. So thank you. Uh, it's time for some questions. Thank you, John. Uh, yeah, there are a number of questions come in during the webinar. Um, if anyone has been thinking of a question and hasn't asked yet, um, please do ask a question now. If we don't get to it, as I said before, uh, we will um, email you the answer within the next few days. And of course, after this webinar, if you are thinking about these things, just email us with any questions uh, and John and I will get back to you as soon as possible. So let's have a look, see what we've got here. Uh, so John, 
the, the first question um, is actually about distribution. Uh, you talked about um, how the product distributes. Uh, is there a way that this distribution can be observed uh, and measured on in a site setting? Uh, thanks for the question, Gareth. Yes, there are. There's a few different ways we can do this. I mean, the most direct way is actually to maybe put a baler in a nearby monitoring well and see if you're getting discoloration. If the water is grayish, then that's an indication that there's product in the well. Probably the most scientific way to do it would be to put a, a logger down the well that measures changes in geochemical parameters. When you get iron in, in, in a monitoring well, you're gonna get a decrease in the ORP, decrease in DO, possibly a slight increase in pH. Um, those, and if you want to, you can also core uh, at, the, at the doses that we use, you might see a little bit of a graying of the soil as well. Yeah, I mean, I guess as well, it's co-applied with other products too. So you might be looking at the geochemistry of the 3DME in there uh, as well. So it's gonna be the same sort of uh, testing I suppose in these wells, the the geochemistry, yeah. Yes, I would think he'd be able to use exactly the same equipment to monitor the ZBI as he would for biological uh, amendments, for example. Okay, uh, great. Uh, this is a uh, next question is more of a clarification, I think. Um, Obviously, with reductive dechlorination, the biological degradation, everyone's concerned about vial, vinyl chloride production. Uh, using this particular amendment, uh, you say that vinyl chloride uh, is not produced. Someone's just asking if you can clarify that, that process. How is vinyl chloride not produced in, in this uh, through this reaction pathway? Okay, if you went back into my uh, presentation, about maybe the third or fourth slide, I, there was a re reaction pathway that, that, I, uh, that I talked about. And the bottom pathway is called beta elimination, where you actually do not um, use a reaction pathway that, that produces daughter products. And what we've seen is that in, in testing in both the field and in the lab, about 10% of the TCE or PCE goes to cis, and maybe about 10% of that goes to vinyl. So I'm not gonna say that you're gonna get zero vinyl, but it's probably about 1% of your parent compound. And if you, that, that vinyl chloride also does react way abiotically, or if you have uh, the helicocoides in, in the system, it'll also be degraded biologically as well. So if, if you're combining the uh, biological degradation with the in situ chemical reduction, you're still going to see some vinyl chloride being produced, but basically the S micro zero down line is going to reduce a lot of that daughter product production. Is that what you mean? Yes, that's correct. You're going to, going to get um, some abiotic degradation of those daughter products, but on top of that, you're going to get just a better bio system. You're going to have a, a lower ORP. You're going to have a lower DO. You're going to have a system where the, the, the microbes are happier and then flourish, get greater concentrations of them. So you actually get your bio working better as well. Okay, great. The next questions. Okay, okay so uh, yeah, is the sulfide layer actually reacting with the contamination? Um, is it the, the, the layer itself that is, is breaking down that contamination? I don't believe so. I think the sulfide layer is actually pretty stable. Most of the uh, electrons that come are actually from the, the reduction, excuse me, the oxidation of the, of the iron in the, at the core of the particle. So, you know, if you have reactivity over a year at that rate, it's pretty, as was shown in, those, in, the, in the longevity or the persistence studies, it's pretty likely that you still have a, a sulfide layer on the surface of the particle. Now you gotta remember most groundwater has some sulfate in it naturally. And although sulfate doesn't react very quickly with, with ZBI, you know, there is probably some that's actually being um, made in situ, not only on the surface of the particle, but also down gradient where you're gonna get reduced iron sulfide particles 
that this is a biogeochemical or bird process, which is also going to give you some longevity as well. So the contamination then is reacting essentially with the zero vinyl iron core, but that sulfide layer is is uh, assisting that process compared to the the iron oxide core, which which was acting as a as an insulator. That's my belief. Yes, that's and it's consistent with what we see in the laboratory and field experiments. Okay, great. Um, Staying with the, the the sulfide layer, you talked about um, the SIMS. Um, someone's asking there: Was the SIMS modeling how the remediation process takes place in the subsurface, or were you using the SIMS for, for something else? Just w w if you could go through that again. All right, that's a good question. No, that that is solely a characterization method. It's destructive and it's destructive pretty rapidly. So we're using that only to basically be able to see the surface of the particle and then subsequently see the interior of the particle to verify the, the existence of a core shell microstructure. So right at the beginning, it means everything that the that micro, microscope could see was red or sulfur. And as we physically remove that layer by the cesium bean, we're exposing the iron. It's not what happens in the field. I, it must have been must have been pretty exciting to um, see that for the first time. I take it after working on these particles for a long time. Yes. Yes, yes it was very exciting. It was it was a fun time. Uh, okay, uh, I think we'll have one more question and uh, then we'll leave it there. Um, as I say, keep asking your questions. We will get back to you with answers, and. Um, Someone just again asking for clarification is uh, what contaminants and, and perhaps you could say what sort of contaminant levels um, is the S micro zero valent aimed at, at treating? The, the primary uh, product is, is used for chlorinated hydrocarbons. So chlorinated ethenes such as PCE, TCE, but also the, the, the uh, chlorinated ethanes such as 111 TCA, or uh, methane such as carbon tetrachloride, chloroform, pretty much the entire range of chlorinated or halogenated compounds that can be electrochemically reduced. But on top of that, there are some other products such as pesticides or herbicides that can be reduced by S micro ZVI. And on top of that, we're, we're also working on metals such as arsenic and chromium and so on top of that as well. So it's been used on several chrome sites, usually in conjunction with 3DME, but not not wholly. Sometimes we've used it alone with good results, and uh, we're doing some arsenic work in the field. And excuse me, in the lab right now, that's that's also been showing very promising results. Very good. And you you say that this is used in combination with the likes of 3D micro motion that's giving you. Uh, biological degradation, and then we've got the bloom stop giving you sorption, and then biological degradation. So, what is the micro zero vinyl ion, the S micro zero vinyl ion, bringing? What advantages is it bringing to to these uh, existing processes? Well, biological degradation, as I explained earlier, is slower. Typically, you know, order of magnitude less fast as abiotic reduction with iron and gives you daughter products. So that's two things that iron won't give you. And the other thing about iron is that it can actually can be co-applied with the plume stop into the same injection wells at the same time, um, which is not always the case with biological amendments. Some, like I said, some biological amendments will um, follow the service of the carbon and that's not a problem with CBI. That's great. that's great. Thank you, John. Um, like I say, keep sending in your questions. We will get back to you. Uh, also, I just want to say in, in an hour, we'll, uh, we'll send you a thank you email and there'll be a feedback survey link in there. Uh, if you or your colleagues would like a formal certificate of attendance, which may contribute to CPD, uh, there's space within the feedback form where you can uh, request this. So please take a moment to fill this out. Uh, we do value your opinion and we use any feedback or topic ideas to improve and plan our future events. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a good afternoon.